Well, I just want to say thank you and how wonderful it is to be in Texas. Uh, we love Texas. You have things that Arkansas doesn't have, like Bucky's. Would you all believe that today was the very first Bucky's experience I have ever had in 42 years of living? Has anybody else not been to Bucky's? Okay, there's a few of you. If you haven't been, you need to go. Not to mention your speed limits are 75. Okay. Everything is bigger in Texas. Uh, I want to begin with Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. These are Paul's words to a church that had some struggles along the way. And it's interesting to me that throughout Paul's writings, he talks about the church and he identifies the church as a body. Uh, the body of Christ, he will say. And uh, later in Ephesians, he identifies the church as the bride of Christ. As he's talking about husbands and wives, and he says, listen, I, I, this mystery that I'm sharing with you is really about Christ and the church. And we realize who we are as people of God, uh, coming together as a body, that we, in fact, are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. He is our head. Isn't it interesting to you how uh, our bodies, when they're not functioning properly, it causes a lot of grief and turmoil, pain, suffering? That's the way it is uh, with our human bodies. But that's the way it is with the church as well. When we're not functioning properly, when we're not, we're not being the people that God wants us to be, then certainly we see a lot of pain and hardship and challenges and struggles all around us in the church struggles to grow and to maintain momentum and to accomplish the mission of God. A few weeks ago, Lindsay and I and our family had the opportunity to meet up with her family for dinner. Uh, now, for the last two years, Lindsay's nephew has been the cutest boy. And he still is. I mean, just take a look at him. And he's been the baby of the family. And everyone caters to him and oohs and awes over him. Look how cute he is. This is Luke, by the way, and Luke is too. Well, a few weeks ago, we had an opportunity to meet up with her family for dinner, and the occasion of the dinner was that we were joining her cousin, who lives in Nashville, Tennessee. We were joining him and his wife and their five-month-old for dinner so that we could meet the five-month-old for the very first time. And you can imagine what happened with Luke. <laughs> when, Lindsay had the opportunity to hold Chase, who was just the cutest little baby. And she decided she was going to go over and show Chase to Luke. And this is Luke's response. <laughs> you ever feel like Luke? I mean, really think about it. Isn't it hard sometimes to accept people that are either new or different from us? And we end up getting, well, maybe just spiritually, maybe not for real, sometimes for real, but we end up getting this kind of look on our faces. And we cut our eyes over because we're thinking, I really, I really don't want to accept that person. The truth is we're all challenged by this all the time. And if we're honest about it, we'll admit that, yes, indeed, there are so many times where we feel threatened, uh, where we feel that our position is being challenged, and that's exactly what was going on that night. Now, everyone 
one still caters to Luke because Chase went home, right? Went back to Nashville, so Luke's good again. But in this moment, everyone was ooing and awing over Chase. And it caused this feeling in Luke. I think the hard thing for us is realizing that too many times in the church, this is what occurs. I want you to think about a few things with me tonight. Dealing with accepting others that are different from us and loving people that are different from us. When you think about the need for unity, I think the foundation of Christian unity is love. So you think about what Jesus had to say. Jesus told his disciples all through his ministry how to treat other people, how to treat one another. And we see especially in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, giving this great treatise of what it looks like to be one of his followers. If I were to ask you the question tonight, if you knew that the end of your life was near and you were praying to God, and I asked you the question, what would you pray for? How would you answer? If you knew that your life was nearing its end and you were praying to God, what would you ask for? What would you pray about? Yesterday I had the opportunity to be with a dear sister of ours, Joanne Castile. Joanne has been battling cancer for a long time. And I got a call yesterday afternoon at about 3 o'clock that they had called hospice in. And so I, I went over to her house and I was kneeling down beside the chair that she was lying in. And just talking to her, you know, and, and like we always do back and forth. And she still had her sense of humor. She's a feisty lady. And she still had her sense of humor. And we were going back and forth. She had fallen uh, about a week ago, I guess, and had bruised her eye. And I told her that her eye was looking a lot better. You know, I didn't want her to get any more fights and that kind of thing. You know, and she's laughing back and forth. And finally kind of got real serious with her. And I just asked her, I said, I, I want to pray with you. And is there anything that you want me to pray for specifically? And in her very weak voice, she said, peace. And so we did. We prayed. And on our way here this morning, at about 10.30, I got a call that she passed away this morning. But the thing in her mind, she knew that her life was ending. The thing she wanted to pray for was peace. What would you pray for? What would you ask God for? Let's look at John 17. John records some of the final words of Jesus to his disciples. We see it in John 17. John revealing more of the prayer of Jesus in the last moments of his life. And I just want you to listen to the prayer. Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh. Give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I've manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them. Not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. 
But now I'm coming to you. And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word. And the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world. So I have sent them to the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent them, and love them, even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I make known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. It's the prayer of Jesus. He knew that in his words, his hour would come. He knew that the end of his life was near. This is his prayer to God. And it's filled with oneness or unity. And he's asking God, help them to be united. Help them to be one. And he goes so far to say, perfectly one. And, and the foundation of that oneness that Jesus is praying about, he says it's between him and the Father, just the same way that he is in God, one. That's what he desires for his people. And so you think about the need for unity, the importance that we ought to be placing on unity. Jesus challenges his disciples over and over again the way that they are to treat one another. And particularly in John 13, verses 34 and 35, we see this new commandment that Jesus presents to them. This is after Judas has run off into darkness to betray Jesus. Now the eleven are there with Jesus. And he says, here's the new command I'm giving you. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And he says, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. It seems that Jesus bases the foundation of who we are as the people of God and as his disciples on love. And so you have to step back from that and say, okay, what does that mean for us? What does that mean as we're the people of God? I want you to think about the early church, particularly the church in Jerusalem. Think about the early church in the first few chapters of Acts and the growth that they enjoyed. Think about the end of Acts chapter 2, where we're told there by Luke about all of the activities of the early church and how they enjoyed favor with all the people. And there they were, sharing what they had with one another, loving on one another, sharing meals together. That's the perfect picture of what God wants of his church. And you see that early church united. And in the first few chapters of Acts, Luke continues to tell us about the wonderful growth of the early church. It's been said that where the oneness of believers is evident, the maximum potential to win lost souls is reached. If our mission is to reach the lost, then certainly the foundation of who we are and our mission ought to be to love one another and be united in our efforts. And so, our mission, our mission is to preach the message of God. And if we preach
preach this message of God is to no avail if people don't know that we belong to Him. If people don't realize that we are His, that we are committed, that our lives are transformed because of who we are in Christ, then what does it matter what we have to say? People aren't going to listen to us. You think back to the Restoration Movement, and you do, if you do much reading in Restoration history at all, you'll see some things that were written regarding unity. And, and those early Restoration leaders really stressed unity. And Thomas Campbell, in his declaration and address, put it this way. And this statement became really a slogan for the Restoration. He said, in matters of faith, unity. Uh, he says, in matters of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in matters, in matters of faith, unity, in matters of opinion, liberty, and in all things, love. That, that became the slogan. Uh, now, there's a couple of different versions of that that we see today. For instance, this one. In, in matters uh, of faith, go to the next one. In matters of faith, unity. And everything is a matter of faith. And I love you if you agree with me on everything. Have you all seen that any today? Just as bad as this one. In everything, liberty. Because everything is simply a matter of opinion. And love is to give in and accept everything. Does that sound like anything we see today in churches? You see all kinds of variations of this uh, original statement regarding unity, regarding faith, regarding matters of opinion, regarding love. And there's all different beliefs about the way that we should respond to other people, about the way that we should even respond to what God has said in His Word. And so we find ourselves in this uh, religious climate where it seems that uh, churches are striving to do something because they simply can't bring themselves to be what Jesus has called us to be. That's the religious climate that we're living in today. And I'm sure you experience it here, just you know, around all of the various congregations. It's true in Little Rock. It's true pretty much everywhere you go. That one congregation to another, we may think this way, another congregation may think that way. And you begin to step back and you say, how are we responding? What, what statement would we make? And I love what Everett Ferguson said. The church is not called to enter the secular arena in order to make the sick world well. She is called to act well and so to serve as a reconciling uh, witness to society. And what he's saying there is this. Look, it's not up to us to go out into this world and somehow change the world uh, by whatever means necessary. But that's what we're finding in a lot of congregations today. They've become political action committees where they're determined to set the world on God's course no matter what the cost. And so you find churches uh, such as one in Chicago that went around in their neighborhood and began asking people, hey, what would you like to see in church? I mean, if we, you were to come to church, what would you want to do? And so they end up having uh, hoops for Christ on Sunday morning. They end up having karate for Jesus. You know, different, all kinds of different things. And from week to week, they changed what they did. And they came together. And that's what our religious climate has become today. The need for unity is greater now than perhaps it's ever been. Because our world has so changed itself, our culture has so shifted, that we've reached this point of saying, well, whatever you think is right, is right for you. And I can't tell you what's right for you. And you can't tell me what's right for me. So we seem to reach an impasse. This is a challenge for us today in church, but I think unity is the place that we have to get back to. And it starts with our congregations. Each individual congregation must commit itself to being united as we're setting out this mission for God. Our emphasis, though, today in a lot of places seems to be to do something for the world rather than being something before the world. 
So we find ourselves in a place where people are turning away from Christianity. People are turning toward agnosticism and, and even atheism still today. But they're not turning to those things because of some evidence or because of some conviction. They're turning away from Christianity because too many Christians aren't acting like Christians. That's the reality. And so we have to realize what's going on in the world around us. And we have to make sure that we are being the people that God has called us to be. I like this quote from Edward Ferguson as well. He said, the truth claims of Christianity are seriously damaged when Christians do not live as Christians. So think about that new command of Jesus again, to love one another. It's probably not so much that conduct proves one to be a disciple as it is. Conduct is a witness to Christ. It's not so much that your conduct is going to prove you to be a disciple of Jesus as it is. It's going to point to him. And that's really what we are to be about. As the body of Christ, we are to be united in such a way that when people see us, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, they will glorify God. And so the plea for unity is seen throughout the New Testament. We certainly see it in the writings of Peter, see it in the writings of Paul as well. And I would ask this question, why shouldn't people judge a church by its members? Why shouldn't other people judge congregations by its members? Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. And so it's the way that we live, it's the way that we show Christ to the world around us. If we spend our time fighting with one another, if we spend our time arguing and, and fussing, if we go out of this place, if you talk to your friends in your workplace or your neighbors and you say, you'll never believe what so-and-so did to me. And I thought they were my sister in Christ. I thought they were my brother in Christ. You'll never guess what happened. And if we go out and we talk about, oh, I can't believe Chris preached that sermon. You know, or whatever it might be. And we're talking negatively to the world around us, those that are outside of the fellowship. What image is that showing of the body of Christ? We have to be united. We have to understand that unity doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to agree on everything. And I think we all know that. I know that's kind of elementary, but I want us to really think about it. Unity doesn't mean that I agree with you on every single point. Unity simply is that two or more people are willing to put the needs of the other in front of their own. And so we've got to reach this point of realizing that as the people of God, we have a mission. And it's not just to proclaim Christ to the world, but it's to live out Christ to the world. Jesus would repeat his new commandment from John 13, he repeats that in John 15 as he's still giving this farewell address to the disciples. It's John 15, verse 12, where he says, this, command, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Peter says something similar, 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Uh, he encourages us to keep loving one another earnestly since love covers up a multitude of sin. And then I want you to think about what Paul does throughout his writing, maybe more so than any other writer in Scripture. Paul talks about unity, and he does so in a variety of ways. He talks about the human body and how all of our various parts have specific functions, and they're all uh, equal in, in necessity, though some are more visible than others. You know, when we stub our toe in the middle of the night, doesn't it hurt? And it, it's such a little toe. It really shouldn't hurt that bad. Does. And so all of the parts of the body are important. But perhaps one of the most practical ways that Paul uh, illustrates unity for us is in the writing of his letter to the church in Rome. I want you to think about that congregation for just a moment. It's a lot like what Jerry Clower. Y'all know Jerry Clower? People in Texas know Jerry Clower. Yeah. You remember Jerry Clower played football for Mississippi State? And there was that time where they were to go to this banquet. 
And he tells about how he had to wear a tuxedo. And he said, I, I've never worn a tuxedo. I've never put on a tie. He said, I didn't even know own a tie. And his roommate got ready before him and left. And there he was in his room trying to figure out how to tie that tie. He said, I went out. He said, I'm looking for somebody that can help me. And he said, I get the elevator to go down and try to find someone. And there's a, a little guy that gets on with him. He said he looked like he got over a hookworm treatment. But he said, he said, I said, sir, do you know how to tie this tie? And the man told him, uh, well, yeah. He said that by that point, he put his leg behind Jerry's and his hands and his chest and just pushed him over backwards. And you remember Jerry says, well, I'm 6'2". I weigh 260. He said, I'm getting ready to get up and knock the fire of this guy. I said, what do you mean? He said, the guy was on top of him and said, hush your mouth, boy. I'm an undertaker. And the only way I can tie this tie is for you to be laying down. <laughs> so I tell you that because it reminds me of this. The background, the background of this letter to the church in Rome is extremely important to understanding what Paul is saying and what he's doing with this letter. And the, the foundation of Romans is unity. It's a plea for unity for this church for struggling with each other. And so you, you find out, you know, you look at history, what all took place in Rome. AD 49, the emperor was Claudius. And Claudius had made this edict that said all the Jews have to leave Rome. There were some riots and some things going on uh, over one who's called Crestus, I believe it was Christ. And so he decides what he's going to do is kick out all the Jews from Rome, and he does. They all have to leave. That's AD 49. Well, in AD 54, Claudius, the emperor, dies. And when an emperor dies, all of the edicts that he makes are done away with. They're wiped away. And so all the Jews, including those that had converted to Christianity, were forced to leave in 49. In 54, they're starting to come back now. This edict is gone. Hey, we're going back home. Well, you can imagine in that congregation that had both Jews and Gentiles in 49, when the Jews had to leave, the Gentiles had to step up. They had to be the leaders, and they did. And the church continued to grow. Well, the Jews start coming back in. And they say, hey, appreciate the Gentiles taking over the leadership while we're gone. But we're back. And we're ready to take our leadership role again. And we're ready to explain to you Gentiles who don't really know any better how church is supposed to be done. That's the background behind this letter. And Paul's writing to them saying, listen, you guys fighting with each other. And so he talks to the, uh, to the Gentile, or about the Gentiles, rather, in chapter 1. You know that whole deal where God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over, verse 24, 26, 28, God gave them over. They should have known about God, uh, you know, and all of his invisible attributes. They should have known about him. Well, then chapter 2 comes. And then he starts talking to the Jews and says, you Jews, you don't need to be acting the way you're acting. And then finally chapter 3 comes. I'm sure we're all familiar with Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And over and over, back and forth, he talks to the Jews, then the Gentiles, then the Jews, then the Gentiles. Finally, he gets to Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, because of all of this that I've been saying to you, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable, perfect. He's saying, listen. This is what you need to be concentrating on. Not worrying about fighting with one another. Not, not worrying about your position or your power. Not being like Luke saying, hey, you guys are coming in and taking our spot. He says, present yourself to God. It's a living sacrifice. Marshall Keeble always said the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. And that's true with us. We keep walking away. Now listen to what he says in verse 3, Romans 12, 
Romans 12. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. What he's saying there is this. Don't be self-intoxicated. Don't be drunk on yourself. Be sober-minded. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Remember, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Then he goes on, verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ. And individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, recognize that God has blessed us all. And don't think that you're better than somebody else. Don't be self-intoxicated. Be sober-minded and serve. Use the gifts that God has given you to bless. And then, verse 9 and following. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And notice verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't be a person who creates strife. Understand who you've been called to be. That's exactly what Paul is saying here to them. This church that has been fighting with one another. Paul wrote this in the winter of 56 into 57. And so you can imagine two years after the death of Claudius, the Jews start coming back in. All of the troubles begin to happen in this church and it struggles over power, over how we think the church ought to be. And so we realize very quickly that Paul is trying to share this very important teaching with us. Sadly, a lot of churches are like the church in Rome. They're a mixed group. They struggle for power. They have issues with one another because, well, I think it ought to be this way. Someone else says, no, I think it ought to be that way. I think we ought to sing these songs. I think we ought to sing these songs. And it becomes power struggle over these matters of opinion. I want you to think about Romans 15. Paul keeps going. He says in uh, verses 5 and 6 that we need to be of the same mind with one another. He says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. Verse 6, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the chaos that would ensue in our bodies if we had two minds? If you had two minds, which mind would your body listen to? And so Paul is urging these Christians, recognize who you are as a child of God. Recognize our great example in Jesus Christ. Paul, we put it this
this way, Philippians 2, verse 5, a very familiar passage. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He says, and being found in human appearance, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now listen to what he said just prior to that. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Begin at verse 1, Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection, sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of of others. So he says we need to be of the same mind. But he also says we need to accept one another. Romans 15 verse 7. Paul says accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And we know how Christ accepted us. He accepted us by giving himself. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in Philippians. That we need to give of ourselves. Put the needs of others above our own. Back in Ephesians 4 now as we close. It says, I urge you therefore, prisoner for the Lord, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called, the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. All through this, Paul is speaking about unity. It's no coincidence, at least in my mind, that there are seven of these ones. Seven is the number of perfection, as you know. And Jesus prayed that we would be perfectly one. Paul doesn't stop there with verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood, the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Then he goes on to say, speaking the truth in love. That's what we need to be about. People who love one another, who are willing to speak the truth of God's word in a way that is kind and loving. And if we see a brother or sister that is wandering away from God's word, we gently go back to them and say, listen, here's what God says. This is not what I say. It's not about me and what I think and what I want. It's about what God thinks and what God says and what God wants. <clears throat> a few things that we can learn from this. One is that only God's standards can be bound in body. Only God's standards can be bound in body. It's not about me and what I want. It's about God, what God said, what God wants. <clears throat> Another truth is that our greatest right is to forego our rights. And the key to unity is selfless discipleship. I love what David had to say in Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. The need for unity is real. And we need to be striving to accomplish the will of God. We need to make sure that we are seeing who we are in Christ. That we're understanding this mission that he has given to us. And maybe you've been struggling to do that. Maybe you've been arguing or fighting with a brother or sister. Maybe you've been holding a grudge for quite some time. Let that go. Understand that we've been called to love one another. We've been called to stand united with the same mind so that God will receive glory. Maybe you've never put Christ on in baptism, but you believe that he is the Son of God. 
and you want to confess that faith tonight, repent of your sins, be baptized, rise a new creature. If we can help you or pray for you in any way, please come while we stand together.